Let's pray as we come to God's word now. Please pray with me. Our loving Heavenly Father, we pray that you would speak to each one of us. We pray that by your spirit you would help us to understand what you have to say. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Well, we are diving back into the letter of Ephesians, but it's been quite a while since we were in Ephesians, so let's have a very brief recap of where we're up to. The Apostle Paul wrote this letter to the church that he planted in the city of Ephesus. You can read about his missionary journey where he visits Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. And in this letter, in the first three chapters, the first half of the letter, the Spirit through Paul focuses on theology. And I don't know, maybe you think theology is boring, it's dry, dusty and irrelevant, but far from that. These first three chapters, this theological section is filled of glorious truth about who God is, about what the Father, Son and Spirit have done, are doing and will do. This great and awesome plan that we can find our place in and what it means for us, who we are in the light of what God has done. And then there's this shift in chapter four as we move on to the second half of the letter. There's a shift, a transition from theology, from this truth to what it means for us day by day, how we're to live in the light of what God has done. And out of all the areas of life that the spirit through Paul could have headlined with, church comes first. In fact, who we are as church is one of the great themes of this letter. How we think and feel about those in church says a lot about how much of the good news of Jesus we've grasped. Church is really, really important. Of course, I should say what I mean by church isn't a building, it's not an institution. Church is the redeemed people of God, those who trust in Jesus. So how does the reality of Jesus having died for our sins and risen again, how does that impact our shared life together as church? Well, it makes us church, makes us who we are, but it also needs to shape our life together. We must be united. That is the point. We must be united as Jesus' people. The right response to all that God has done is for us to love and to serve one another. In chapter 4 verses 2 and 3 we're told what is necessary for us to be united and to stay strong together. We must be completely humble and gentle. We must be patient, bearing with one another in love. And we it, it, it will require effort, but every, every ounce of effort that we have will be absolutely worth it to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So that's a very brief recap of what we've covered so far. And now our passage today deals with, again, why church unity is so important. You see, though chapters one to three, the first half of the letter is full of theology, even now as Paul moves on to apply that and say what it means for us, the way that we live, he won't allow us to forget the great reasons why we're to live that way, because following Jesus is filled, full of meaning. There's a reason behind everything that we do. And when it comes to church, when it comes to church life, we need these big reminders of who we are, what God has done. Because when we fall out with someone else in church, our world shrinks. Our vision becomes fixated on trivial matters that only concern ourselves. We lose sight of the great and awesome plan of God. So we need the Spirit through the Scriptures to throw open the curtains and let God's truth shine in. So that's what's going on here in this passage, in chapter 4, verses 4 to 6. It's getting rid of the blinkers, and it's throwing open the curtains, and the message is we must be one. And that is and the reason why we must be one. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. There is one God. There is not many gods. 
Though many claim to be God, the Bible is clear there is one God, Father, Son and Spirit. And this one God has provided one way to be saved, to be rescued from sin and death. And all those who are saved are gathered into one church, one body, one people. So we must be one. This is all there is. And that has to be more than just an idea. Our oneness, our unity must be seen. It must be felt. It must be real, in other words. Let me tell you a story. A long time ago, there were three families living by the same bay of the Welsh coastline. The Joneses, the Davises and the Thomases. Now, you would think that they would get along. You would think that they would help each other. They had so much in common. However, they really didn't. Though they dwelt close together, they were far from each other in their hearts. The three families were rivals. Each family hated the other two. You see, the Joneses were always the most successful at selling the fish in the nearby town. Not by any virtue of the product, but because one of the Joneses' sons had moved to the town and become important. And that son used his influence to give preferential treatment to his own. So obviously the Davises and the Thomas family hated the Joneses. And then there were the Davis family, and they were expert craftsmen. When the other two families needed one of the Davis boys to make repairs on their boats or their houses, the Davises would have the utter cheek to overcharge extortionate rates and even to gloat over the other family's ineptitude at handiwork. So, obviously, the Joneses and the Thomases hated the Davises. Now, the Thomases had only recently moved to the village. They came from the next village down the coast, so they were outsiders, they were strangers, they were weird, not to be trusted one bit. They had only lived in the village for three generations. <laughs> so naturally the Joneses and the Davises hated the Thomases. So early one spring morning, just before sunrise, all the men of each family were out in the fishing boats fishing. Then seemingly out of nowhere came the worst storm for a hundred years. It was ter terrifying. The Joneses' vessel was first hit and worst struck. It was disaster from the ancient old man in the boat down to the fairest young youth. All of them were thrown out into the perilous sea. It just so happened that the waves swept the Thomas's fishing boat to the perfect position to rescue the lost Jones fishermen. Yet despite the Jones men cries for help, the Thomas men bitterly resolved to do no such thing. Good riddance was the verdict. So leaving the wretched Jones behind, the Thomases rode with all their might in hope to reach the shore. As they struggled, it just so happened that they were given yet another opportunity to rescue, this time rescue the Davis family. They heard their pleas and a faint glimmer of compassion moved them to help this time. So they hauled each of the surviving Davises on board. Then there followed a very brief and a very awkward uh, display of gratitude. The first manifestation of peace for generations. Nevertheless, it was soon jettisoned because the extraordinary turbulence caused a, a compass to fall from the youngest Davis lad's jacket. This wasn't any old compass. The storm billowing against the boat was nothing compared to the darkness churning in the souls of the Thomases at the sight of this particular compass because it was precious. It was a Thomas family heirloom which had mysteriously gone missing and so had caused suspicion and grief within the Thomas family. It had been stolen by those thieving Davis boys. As the light of understanding dawned on the Thomases, that faint glimmer of compassion was consumed with rage. Every last Davis was cast off of the Thomases' boat at knife point. The distracted Thomases discovered too late now that their boat was about to collide with rocks hidden beneath the waves. 
The damage wasn't as severe as it could have been. Nothing that a Davis couldn't fix, yet it was beyond the expertise of the Thomases. And tragically, every tragically the last little fishing boat sank along with the hopes of the last fisherman. It's a tragic story, but this is the lesson. They refused to be united in life, so they unwittingly were united in death. There is one God. There is one way that that God has provided for us to be saved. And he has gathered all those who have been saved into one people. If we refuse to be united in life, we will be united in death. No help to others and no hope for ourselves. The Bible makes it clear many, many times that either you are saved or you're not saved. There's no middle ground. There's only two camps. Either we belong to Jesus and we're part of his church and therefore members of a local church, or we don't belong to Jesus and then we're in serious trouble. There was a time in Jesus' ministry when many of his disciples turned back. They no longer followed him. And at that time, Jesus asked the twelve, you do not want to leave too, do you? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and to know that you are the Holy One of God. I trust as you listen to all this, you have a building sense of the great significance of church unity. There is one body. That's to say there is only one true people of God, though there are many religions. Only one religion can be true, despite what the pluralistic secular society wants to say. Maybe you've heard of the common illustration of the elephant to explain how all religions are part of a greater truth. The elephant illustration goes something like this. There are four blind men who discover an elephant. And since the men have never encountered an elephant before, they grope about seeking to understand and dis dis to describe this new phenomenon. One grasps the trunk and concludes it's a snake. <clears throat> Another explores one of the elephant's legs and says it's a tree. The third finds the elephant's tail and announces it's a rope. And the fourth blind man, man, after discovering the elephant's side, concludes that it's a wall. Each in his blindness is describing the same thing, an elephant, yet each describes the same thing in a radically different way. It's a popular analogy because it appears to allow all religions to be right to some degree. Each religion has part of the truth. The thing is, apart from being wrong, this is highly arrogant. Why? Because there is another person in this story who isn't mentioned. There is the narrator. The narrator, the one telling the story, can see and can see that all the blind men are partially right, but they're actually all wrong. And only the narrator can see the full picture, that they've only got part of the truth and they can see the whole elephant. So it's very, very arrogant because the person using this illustration to say that all religions are the same is saying they understand every single religion better than all of the followers of all those religions. You see the Quran fervently distinguishes Islam from Christianity. It couldn't be more clear and from Judaism and from polytheism. It is mutually exclusive in its claims. Hinduism likewise makes claims that contradict Christianity. They cannot both be true. The Bible presents itself as absolutely true. Either Jesus is who he claims to be or he is not. And here in Ephesians, we're told that there is one body, one true people of God, meaning Jesus is redeemed people. Each religion and each worldview, for that matter, is making a claim on absolute truth. They're not saying they've got part of it. They're saying they've got all of it. They can see the whole elephant, just as the secular philosophy says, which uses the illustration. Saying all religions are true is ignorant of each teaching and arrogant in thinking that they know better than everyone else. 
The truth has got to be out there, though, hasn't it? There can only be one truth. And the thing about Christianity is that you can actually investigate the evidence for Jesus. You can research the claims made. You can look into the historical events. And more importantly, though, there's a promise by the God of the Bible saying, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. If Jesus is who he claims to be, then he is alive today. He's available. You can know him. And in fact, there have been many, many people who have honestly prayed with just a mustard seed of faith and a whole lot more doubt, saying, Lord Jesus, I want to know you. I want to know the truth. And eventually, the same people who have prayed that, so full of doubt, but with a mustard seed of faith, have come to a solid conviction that Jesus is Lord. Seek and you will find, knock and the door will be open to you. There is one God and there's one way to be saved and there's one people of God. And yes, there are many denominations of Christianity, so many it can be confusing, all these different churches. But apart from all the labels there are, those who authentically know Jesus and are known by Jesus make up one people, despite all the different names and descriptions. And it is actually it is actually having a relationship with him through faith that counts with Jesus. Therefore, as we trust in Jesus, we are part of a global community, whether a person calls himself charismatic or evangelical or reformed or church of wales or methodist or baptist or pentecostal ultimately what does it matter what really matters is do you know jesus and are you known by jesus is jesus christ the jesus christ who's revealed in the bible your lord and savior if that is true then whatever ways and words we use to describe ourselves, our position on secondary issues, we are brothers and sisters in Christ. If Jesus is our Lord and Saviour, we are part of the same body, the life in those other people, maybe over the other side of the world, the, the life through the Spirit in them is the same life that's in me by the grace of God. So two believers from entirely different cultures and backgrounds and might be wildly different on secondary issues of theology, yet are brothers and sisters in Christ, part of the same body, because we share in the same life given by the Spirit. We are in the same boat, as it were. There is one hope that we have, we are all looking forward to the same glorious destination. When I went to the shop the other day, I had that incredibly awkward experience that you sometimes have. I was chatting to this person I hadn't seen for a little while. and We had a good catch up, socially distant, wearing masks, of, of course. But then we said our goodbyes. But at each subsequent aisle that we went round, we kept on bumping into each other and asked them to acknowledge. Oh, yeah, we see you again because we're both heading in the same direction. And as God's people, we are all heading in the same direction. We are meant to be journeying together. There is one hope and there is one Lord Jesus and one true faith in him. And we all out of obedience, pledge our allegiance to him in baptism, one baptism. And that baptism symbolises us being united to Christ, being united in his death and being united in his life. We belong to him and he belongs to us. That's what it all symbolises. And through that, uh, through that togetherness with Jesus, we are washed clean of our guilt and sin. Once I was in the selection process of a leadership role at a church, and it came down to just me and one other person. And I can remember speaking with the, the other guy who was up for the job. And it was after the service that he had just preached at. And he said something to me, which has always stuck with me. He said, remember, Dom, we're on the same team. Remember, 
We're on the same team. Remind yourself whenever there's ever a hint of rivalry or disagreement that you have with someone else in church. We are on the same team. If Christ is our captain, we're on the same team. We have the same goal. Despite our differences, we stand or we fall together. In the same way, there is one God and Father who is over all and through all and in all. Paul isn't talking generally here. Yes, God the Father is sovereign over absolutely all in all creation. That's true, but that's not the point here. It can't be because Paul would be saying that the Father is through all people and in all people, irrespective of whether they belong to Jesus or not. And that goes against the clear teaching of many other parts of the Bible. What Paul is emphasising here, then, is that every true believer in Jesus not only shares in the same life through the Spirit, but also is a precious child of God the Father. So that even if a person is nothing in the eyes of the world, maybe they can't earn a living, they don't have a, a well-paying job, they have no status in the community, but if they believe in Jesus, they have God the Father as their father, they are a precious child to the Lord Almighty, by the grace of God. And therefore they are a son or daughter of the King of Kings, they are princes or a princess not of some puny little kingdom on earth, but of, Christ, of the kingdom of Christ, which will never pass away. So we ought to show every Christian that highest level of respect. Whatever, whoever they are, if they follow Jesus, they are a precious child of God and therefore should be seen, viewed as, known as our precious brother and sister or sister in Christ. Of course we respect all people whether they're Christian or not as everyone's made in the image of God and we're taught to love our enemies and to, to show love and kindness to all people. That is true and yet there remains this extra level to which we value fellow believers. We must regard them as our brothers and sisters in Christ because that is who they are. Their father is my father and together we call on God the Father as our father in heaven. There is one God, Father, Son and Spirit. There is one way to be saved and we are one worldwide community of believers. Now it's all well and good hearing about this but it must shape, it must shape the way that we welcome people into church. What a wicked thing it was for the for the Thomas family to forget about the Jones fishermen and leave them. There's one way to be saved. Let's be eager to welcome anyone and everyone that we can who trusts in Jesus into the membership of the church. And likewise, all of this must shape the way which we view our brothers and sisters in Christ. And it must shape the way that we relate to fellow believers. If you are not on good terms with someone, Christ would command you today, in the light of all that's been said, to sort it out. It really, really matters. Seek reconciliation. Seek forgiveness and forgive as Christ has forgiven you. By the power of Jesus's blood and for his glory, please sort out any grief that you have with someone else. Let's steer far clear from being like those fishermen in the story. Let's be united in life.